It's good to see some of the old faces. So as you've uh, gathered, this field is in its an infancy and there's a long road ahead. And as we go ahead, I'm gonna try to convince you we have a lot of paradigms to break. I'll talk about some of these. We have to talk about the science because the old science doesn't quite apply. We'll talk a little bit about language, some about regulation, and some about clinical trials. All of this we need to question um, and uh, shift some paradigms along the way. Now, I have to start with my own index case. That's usually how my talks go. This was in 2008, 61 year old woman who had chronic diarrhea for eight months, started with antibiotic treatment. She had multiple hospitalizations for dehydration, received antibiotics along the way. She was in a wheelchair having bowel movements every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. Lost 60 pounds over this time. Of course, the disease that she had is C. difficile infection. In fact, I did a flexible sigmoidoscopy right in the office when I saw her and she had pseudomembranous colitis, just as shown in these um, pictures here. It's a severe form of uh, C. difficile infection. And so we know that C. difficile infection is a direct complication of antibiotic therapy. And our intestine, particularly colon, that's its natural home, is of course also home to a very rich microbial community that's part of our digestive system. When you take antibiotics that gets perturbed, disrupted, and makes you vulnerable to this infection if you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. You ingest C. difficile, typically in the form of spores. And once they find their way to the colon, they germinate if the conditions are correct. And these uh, newly vegetative cells now live awaken a bacteria, make toxins, and those damage the lining of the colon. And what do we do? We treat that, of course, with antibiotics. That's the standard therapy. With every round of therapy, you risk having this disease come back. The problem is antibiotics such as vancomycin does not kill the spores of C. difficile, but it does kill the normal microbes, which is your first line protection against it. So every round of recurrence invites greater possibility that it's gonna come back again. First time infection, maybe 20, 30%. Each round, add another 20% chance. After two, three, four rounds of antibiotic treatments, you have an indefinite syndrome of recurrent C. difficile infection, and it's very unlikely to go away unless you stay on vancomycin continuously long-term or terminate this. And of course, if we reintroduce the microbes back, as Dr. Brody uh, cited Ben Eisman, that works. It works its magic. It restores the ecology and with 90 plus percent chance, you achieve a clinical cure. All right, so I wanna show this what actually happens. This is a microbial community, normal microbial community. Actually, we are only looking at bacteria. The intestinal microbes are far more complex than this. There are other domains of life. There's archaea, there's fungi, there's protozoa. There is viruses. For every bacterial cell, there is 10 bacteriophage. It's an ecological system. We have predator-prey relationships. And we don't really fully or uh, understand what makes this microbial community stable, what makes it resilient. We are really at a, at infancy, but it seems that it's, uh, in broad terms, it's pretty much similar uh, among humans. Now, the green lines there, this is a network analysis. The green lines show cooperation between different bacterial species. The red lines are competition. It's a community just like um, any community you can imagine, a community of humans, where we have all kinds of humans to make it work. 
You need to have doctors, you need to have lawyers, you need to have firemen, you need to have hairdressers, etc. You don't want a community that looks like this, which is full of lawyers, for example, not very functional. This is a community of a CDF patient who's had multiple rounds of antibiotics. Now you see this community is totally decimated. And you can see probably now that you cannot fix this with one or two probiotic strains. In order to recover this, you have to give the full community back. And this is what happens in this fecal microbiota transplant. So on the left, you see a donor. On the bottom is the patient. On the right is the patient after the procedure about a week later. You see a complete restructuring of the microbial community structure back to normal. That's the paradigm that I think people need to absorb because there's many who will tell you they've got this magic strain of microbe that can fix a problem like this. It's very unlikely. Now, next paradigm. In 2013, we had a meeting with the FDA. It was a public meeting where uh, the FDA took notice of this practice and decided it's time for some regulation. And the major decision they had to make is how to classify this. And they listened to the scientists on day one, they listened to physicians on day two, and then they came with their pre-made slides with a conclusion. The conclusion is the fecal microbiota, when used to cure, treat, mitigate, or prevent a disease, it's called a drug, a biological product. This actually caused a bit of ruckus at that meeting. Uh, it was fairly vociferous because what this means is that this is following a drug paradigm. You can't just do this. You have to get FDA approval. You have to seek approval by, fi the, by filing a uh, IND, investigational new drug application. That's just for starters. And it's just more than an application. You, know, you have to report and everything. And you have to do it to the FDA satisfaction. But, you know, there was, um, this is still a topical issue. This is not how it's regulated, for example, in Australia. Uh, this is not uniform across Europe. Uh, in fact, you know, some people uh, in, in um, some countries decided this should maybe follow a uh, blood banking paradigm as a transfusion kind of therapy which is a little different. Be that as, as it may be, this is one paradigm which I decided uh, enough of this. Uh, if it is a drug, then let's talk about its pharmacology. What is the pharmacology of this drug? Well, if we're gonna talk about pharmacology, then we have to understand the pharmacy, which is its formulation. How do you make it together? How, how do you put it together? How do you choose the donors? What's the whole protocol of your donor program? How do you cryopreserve or liopreserve? How do you encapsulate? There's a lot goes into this. And then what about pharmacokinetics? Okay, pharmacokinetics is a study of how the drug moves in the body, okay? What do we know about that? This is not like small molecules. This is not like biologics. These drugs are live microbiota. They replicate, they divide. They increase in number. What drug do you take and it actually grows inside your body? Pharmacodynamics, that's mechanisms. And what does the drug do to your body? And then if you understand all that, then you have pharmacotherapeutics. You can put it all together. Now you can make rational decisions on how to treat your patients. Or what about toxicity? Drug-drug interactions. You know, it's probably a dumb idea to give antibiotics and microbiota together, but some people have done it because they haven't thought it through. Okay, so for example, on, the, on this graph, you show a typical graph of pharmacokinetics of a small molecule. If you're below that line, the drug is subtherapeutic, doesn't quite work. If you're above that, you might run into toxicity. Every time you dry, take a drug, you see a circulating level spike up and then it goes down. After about four or five doses, you achieve a, a, um, a steady level. And that works for small molecules. Well, what about the drugs like FMT. Well, hmm. 
is a completely different picture here. So the blue stuff is what pharmacology normally thinks about. It's your body. Drug gets absorbed, gets through the liver, may come back from the liver. It's enterohepatic circulation. Not everything makes it past that. There's modification in the liver, and then it goes into circulation and all the different organs. Now here, we're targeting a rather unique compartment, which is the intestine, which is the most open of all the body compartments to the environment. It's modulated by diet. There's microbes all around us. And yet the microbial community that lives inside the intestine is very much resilient. It's adapted to its host. Its members are human microbiota. That's kind of where our argument with the FDA was that they define it as a drug because this is not human transplant. But these are human microbiota. You can't just take any microbes from a different species and put it in. They're not going to engraft. The same thing happens if you try to engraft human microbes into some other species. It doesn't work very well. They've adapted to this host. But importantly, it's a live community. And it's modulated by environment. And you have to think about what is the role of diet on your treatment? What if you are taking probiotics? How is that going to affect your treatment, et cetera? Um, and within this compartment, if we really think about pharmacokinetics, then we have to think about its constituents. There's the ADME of pharmacokinetics, absorption, metabolism, distribution, excretion. So if you think about ex distribution, well, what are you trying to target? The microbial communities in the colon are different from the small intestine. Microbial communities in the lumen of the intestine are different from those that are adherent to the lining. And there's all kinds of micro compartments within that. Typically what we sample is just the stool and that's only, uh, and that serves as a surrogate for everything else, but that may not be true at all. So, um, you know, if we think about it as a drug, so here's some uh, evolution in our program of, um, of what this is. So in 2010, as the patient uh, that we reported, we were using fresh, freshly blended stool. You can see it there. Um, and then by 2012, we developed a standardized preparation. This is now cryopreserved with glycerol. So we discovered that glycerol is pretty good at preserving the entire microbial community. And that's been later shown in randomized clinical trials as well. Um, but that uh, actually was, I will say, is a pretty seminal step because this is what allowed FMT to take off around the world and result in treatment of, of at least 100,000 patients with C. diff, maybe 50, 60,000 in the US and a comparable number in Europe. This really allowed bringing it into the mainstream medicine because you could uh, re rigorously screen and test the donors, and then you can uh, bank the material and it will be available for treatment when needed. By 2015, we made an oral preparation of freeze-dried encapsulated microbiota, uh, which this, this figure actually shows the uh, single dose to treat a C. diff patient uh, with about 80% efficacy. And you see in 2018, a uh, minor innovation, uh, we made our capsules Swedish orange, and that's still our color. It's an important innovation because we can do placebo controlled trials that look identical, uh, the placebo and, and microbiota. Now, this is what pharmacokinetics of these uh, preparation looks like. This is the capsule preparation. We're looking over a period of a year. Uh, let's see, you can ignore this uh, left upper quadrant panel. About two thirds of patients uh, get this pattern. 
the y-axis shows you similarity to donor. That is a reflection of engraftment of donor microbiota. The x-axis is time. And you see fairly quick uptake of donor microbiota. This is C. diff patients. Very unique situation of patients that are preconditioned with about average patient four or five months of repeated antibiotic treatment, decimated microbiome, relatively easy to fix. But even that is not a simple problem. So you can see there is a spread of how much microbiota is engrafted. And it's, these patients didn't take antibiotics for the rest of the year. And in, the, in this group, it pretty much stayed as a new microbial community that's made of part donor, part residual microbes from the original host uh, microbiota, as well as whoever's um, new microbes that came in from the environment. An interesting fraction of patients showed this other pattern where there was an uptake of donor microbiota, but by the time we look at one year, it doesn't look anything like the donor. Now they didn't take antibiotics, their microbial community just evolved into something else. And then there was another like 15%, uh, which didn't seem to take the microbiota. It failed. They didn't relapse with C. diff, but I consider this a failure. Oops. Um, probably an engraftment failure, which means we still need to do more optimization on these preparations. Now, what, how should science inform clinical trial design? So a big concept that really uh, hasn't penetrated into, I'd say it's still the majority of the scientific body is that we're dealing with microbial communities. You have to think of them as a unit. You have to introduce ecological concepts, the science of ecology in, in order to understand it. There's uh, um, the idea that you can fix a microbial community with just one or two microbes is in a way a, uh, a mirror image of the um, germ, germ theory of disease the Koch's postulates. Robert Koch discovered that mycobacterium tuberculosis causes tuberculosis. He had to grow this microbe in a lab. He had to infect animals and re-isolate it. And he had to show that putting the um, microbe back into the animal would cause the disease. Those are Koch's postulates. The focus has been exclusively on that microbe that causes the disease. Nowhere in there is their thought that the body is full of microbes itself? And how is that part of the whole human body? Now, you, you can't really think that the microbial community is a sum of its individual constituents. You really have to think of it as a network, as a whole community. And, and that's, that really hasn't penetrated. What does that mean? That means that the scientists and the regulators think about only one thing when they think about uh, approving a drug, what goes into the patient. They don't necessarily think about how to select the right patient because maybe not everybody's microbiome is appropriate for this intervention, for this particular formulation. It's important for the appropriate endpoints. So yeah, sure, you can have a clinical endpoint like by two months, you have clinical cure of C. diff. That's great. Uh, but just because you may have put in highly selected microbes that may have been thoroughly investigated and they don't bring, don't have any virulence factors, don't have any antibiotic resistance, that doesn't mean you're done. You still have to go and see what happened to that microbial community at the end of the treatment, at two months, at six months, at a year maybe just giving a couple microbes, even if they work, that's not enough because there's gonna be other microbes that will come in that will bring all kinds of badness unless you repair the entire microbial community. Alex, two minutes. How do we incorporate diet? All right, I'll, uh, next paradigm. How do we call this treatment? 
before FMT was a name, which I participated in naming, it was fecal bacteria therapy. Dr. Brandt uh, raised the question, is that really right? Because there's more than bacteria. So we had a meeting and came up with this term. I hated the fecal word back then. And this is exactly what happened. You heard throughout this meeting named fecal transplant. There is no such thing as fecal transplant. You cannot transplant feces. You can do a microbiota transplant. You're transplanting microbiota. Feces is a very complex substance. Now, nobody would care, but it really does damage the field. I discovered that patients don't like it. I certainly discovered that scientific review doesn't like it. They think it's, you know, poop. Some scientists have decided to call it transfer or implant. Both of these terms are wrong because transfer doesn't acknowledge the donor and implant is about artificial things. So I came up with a name with Dr. Brand of intestinal microbiota transplant, emphasizing intestinal because that's thinking about the patient rather than the donor. I actually made it into a textbook, but it's not taken off. The best reason uh, I heard is that the word, um, the, the letter I just doesn't roll off the tongue. IMT doesn't sound as good as FMT. And Dr. Zhang, WMT is not going to get any traction for the same reason. I actually like Dr. Uh, Adams, microbiota transplant therapy. The therapy here emphasizes you may need more than just the microbiota. There could be antibiotic in there. There could be a prep. There could be a different regimen. Uh, and, and really the word fecal is unnecessary. Now, the last paradigm is how does the science move from bench to bedside? This is what regulators and many scientists believe this is what happens. You have an idea, you do some research at the bench, maybe you play with microbes in a petri dish and do some animal models, and then you develop some kind of formulation and then it goes into these phases of trials, looking at safety, efficacy, you increase the number of participants and you seek regulatory approval. And then it goes into clinical practice and maybe there's some feedback from clinical practice. Well, in this field, everything happened in reverse order. It started with clinical practice. You heard Dr. Brody's talk. He was curing patients way before any of this happened. So this is really not the way science often works. I'd say this is actually not unique to this field. This is just the way the regulators like to think about it. This is the real thing. It can, it can start at any place. You can start with a clinical observation. You can go back to the lab. You can do some research. You can go back to the clinical observation. It takes a long time to actually develop something. And yet this is the paradigm. And this is the paradigm of funding as well. Basic research, that's university, maybe government or government and university, you do some stuff. And then the uh, concept is that the industry is going to take these ideas and bring it to commercialization. So use a taxpayers and such pay for the part one and the investors get the rewards for part two. This is a, a, a conundrum that's been around for a long time because many ideas never see the light of day. A lot of good ideas that get born on the science side really don't get translated into cures, you know, and, and it's not trivial because, you know, you have to go in order to cross this valley of death there's many checkpoints that you have to go through. I mean, really, it's, it's expensive. It could take a billion dollars to carry a drug to market. So you do need to fundraise. You do need to think about intellectual property. You need to think about regulation and clinical trials are expensive. Now, the FDA back in 2013, after the raucous meeting, about two months later, came up with Enforcement discretion. You can treat C. difficile, it's allowed, as long as it's not responding to standard therapies. You do have to get informed consent and explain all the risks and, it under, and explain to the patient that this is investigational therapy, but there is no federal regulation over it. In other words, uh, it's illegal, but it's not regulated, so you can do it. As long as it's C. diff. 
If it's not C. diff, it's other indications, all of the stuff beyond C. diff that was talked about has to be clinical trials. This was, this is part of what it means. This is just an amendment to our IND describing the capsule preparation because we already had the liquid formulation. All the donor stuff was the same, it was just a little modification on how you run the machine and a little update. Obviously your physician is not able to do this and there was a team preparing all this. We manufacture these products under GMP conditions, uh, which is heavily, of course, regulated and FDA approved site. So for a patient who is interested in a microbiota transplant for a non c difficile indication, what is possible? Well, you can see if there's a clinical trial, clinicaltrials.gov. There is a mechanism for compassionate use single patient INDs, and occasionally we've done that, but it's, it's considerable work. Uh, you, it, you still have to file the same kind of application for the single patient uh, and get FDA approval. Um, or you could you have a compassionate use group IND, which is a little harder. Uh, and I just want to, you know, bring this model here. I do some research for cystic fibrosis. It's a pretty unusual disease, pretty rare. There's only 30,000 patients in the US with this, yet most people know about it. Um, it's a, even though it's a rare disease. And I can tell you, so back in uh, 1950s, 1960s, life expectancy was about 16 years. Today, a median life expectancy is 42. If you live to 42, you can expect another 20. And babies born with CF today are being optimistically told that they'll probably live a normal lifespan. I can tell you for sure that drug companies were not particularly interested in this market of 30,000 patients. It is the patient community that got together and did a lot of this research. They've been very strategic about it, what exactly they did, and the progress has been amazing. And you look at the research budget of the CF Foundation and compare it to, let's say, inflammatory bowel disease. There's 3 million people with inflammatory bowel disease. The CF Foundation has more money overall dedicated to research than the Crohn's Colitis Foundation that looks after all inflammatory bowel disease. Yet, each patient spends about fifty dollars to $100,000 a year on biologics with IBD. So this is our program, and this is really a call to action. Now, our program is, is small. It's an academic program. We manufacture fecal microbiota products that I showed under GMP conditions. We have an IND. Our mission is, well, one is to treat patients with C. diff. There's still many of them. Uh, we decided that for them, at least the ones that come to our clinic, we treat them for free. Our mission is to support academic clinical trials. There's many high risk trials that industry doesn't want to take right now because they're trying to get products to market, uh, but research needs to be done. And this is a call really to action because I'm sure many of you are interested, how can this benefit me? But I'll call you to be partnering with a group like Achieving Cures Together and you can help to fund, for example, small clinical trials to move this science forward. We can ask real scientific questions. The problem is when you go to NIH and you talk about fecal transplants, and they kind of like ask, well, what's your hypothesis? And is it really well developed? You have to be pretty much halfway done to get some funding. And that's, uh, NIH certainly is an important source. Um, but ultimately, well, then when you get to a point when you actually did a clinical trial, they'll say, well, this is no longer for us. This is a job for industry. Fair enough. And I showed you that could have its own problems. So I hope that some of you will get motivated and think, 
I want to be part of this. I want to be an active participant and not just watch this from the side and read about it. Thank you so much.